I mean, look, Tola the man last time. <laughs> <laughs> now, please have a cushion also. No, 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 no. Oh, look how tall I look. Oh, thank you for <laughs> dialing in today. <laughs> We're going to start it. Yeah. So let's talk about, because it's been maybe four months since we last spoke in the middle of the last lockdown. And, and a very good interview that was, Rupert. Thank yeah. you. Yes, it got great feedback and everyone loved your data as much as I did. So, Stop it. Yeah, it's, it's great. We're going to talk more about that today. But I want an update on where the investment property market is today. What's happening? What are you seeing? Well, uh, shall I start with that? Go on then. Uh, so so uh, post lockdown... Uh, our business has seen huge growth. And I think it's a combination of things. I think part of it is just the natural growth in our business. We have, uh, you know, we just, we just took over our seven year anniversary and uh, which, which means that we've got a you know, high number of clients that we've dealt with and are coming back as repeat clients. Um, I think that during the lockdown, because we spent the whole time just educating and putting as much information out to get away from the noise that was in the media, I think that's been really positive. And then there's this perfect storm because we deal with a lot of developers, obviously, when we're dealing with new property. And developers need pre-sales more than ever at the moment because uh, their banks are demanding. Rather than they sell 50% off plans, they have to sell 90 to 100% uh, to give the bank a lot, a lot more certainty before they give the developer funding. Now, as a result, that means that prices that they're offering are probably better than they would have been if we didn't have a lockdown. Uh, and often developers like to keep properties till the end to get the maximum uh, sale price. And, and they, don't, they don't have the option to do that in a lot of cases at the moment, unless they're really, really rich. Then we've got the easing of LVR, uh, restrictions, which has been massive, uh, because it means that you've got more usable equity in your home and your and your rental properties if you've got them already, and potentially you can borrow more money against a rental property that you're buying. Then you've got record low, unheard of interest rates, and they're going lower. Yeah. And so at the moment, I can find a property in Auckland for a new investor that is cash flow positive from day one. I never thought that's, that you would be able to buy something in Auckland that's a decent investment property, cash flow positive from day one, borrowing 100%, and you can. And so um, it's it's just amazing to think, uh, like um, we did a podcast this week about three properties that I've bought in Auckland in the last week because it's just amazing. It's such yeah, a good yeah. time to buy and it's going to get better. It's got to have been decades since it was cash flow positive in Auckland. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Unless you're buying like an apartment that's, you know, crummy capital growth. Um, yeah. Like to get a decent quality rental property that's going to give you good, solid future growth, you'd normally have to put in either a big deposit or a weekly contribution that's, you know, probably three to $500. Now it's cash flow positive. It's amazing. And that can help, you know, just grow your portfolio faster. So it is a really good time. It is challenging with banks at the moment, which I'm sure you can talk more about. Yeah, really, really slow. They're being really, really cautious. A lot of our clients who are um, absolute no-brainer deals are finding it hard to get finance uh, and just getting a lot of, you know, checks with uh, their income stability. Um, Self-employed people are having a real hard time at the moment. But if you can get the money, buy a house. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of, because of that finance, a lot of the buyers have been taken out of the market, right? So that's a great Absolutely. time to be buying. Absolutely. Yeah. And then Andrew, you'll know that the question used to be, what was your previous income? The question now is, what are you going to earn in the next six months to Absolutely. a year, right? Future income. Absolutely. Which can be really hard because uh, a lot of people like ourselves included, like our income completely stopped for two months. And so that obviously, if you go and apply for finance would make a bank a little bit nervous, yep. but then, uh, you know, the flow on afterwards, you know, there's the, that, that money comes in again, but banks just are really, really cautious. They want to know that this is going to continue. And look, let's face it. There are a lot of band-aids holding the economy together at the moment. And so it's not going to be all rosy for everyone forever there is going to be some challenging times next year, I believe. And that's why the interest rates will be coming down to stimulate the economy and to stimulate inflation. Um, but if you can buy something and hold it for the long term, you're going to get some capital growth at some stage. So it doesn't matter if it's tomorrow or if it's in five years time, so long as you're going to get that growth. But to buy in the super city, i.e. Auckland, 
I think is awesome. Again, we've done a lot of education around other areas like Hamilton and Christchurch and where they are in the property cycles. Um, we, we've we been inundated with inquiry for people outside of Christchurch wanting to buy in Christchurch. Um, so probably Christchurch and Auckland are my two hotspots at the moment with Hamilton being a third. Okay, interesting. Not Wellington. Wellington's had a bit of a party lately, but not a lot of stock there, right? Uh, yeah, so, so Wellington's issue, uh, major issue is the stock, which yeah. is why I think there will continue to be some good growth there. But I do think it is at the tail end of its property cycle. I think the dance will stop in 12 to 18 months. And so it's probably not going to see growth like it has for the last five years. And when Auckland levels out, it tends to be for a long period of time. So we were just talking, uh, we we're just doing a recording actually before this, talking about, hey, look, you can buy anywhere in over 15 years, it's going to go up in value, uh, apart from West Coast. But if you're buying in Wellington today and it's finished in 12 months time and then you don't get growth for the next eight years, that's going to slow down your ability to grow a portfolio. So it's not that you shouldn't invest there. It's just that it might not be the right time right now. And now's never been a really more important time to think about both cash flow and capital growth, right? Like you used to be able to negatively gear your stuff and just play on that capital growth. But I think cash flow is more and more the one, eh? Absolutely. Well, I mean, now you've got increased uh, regulation around around tenancies and, and when yeah. you can increase your rents. And so, uh, you, and then of course, you can't offset your losses against your personal income anymore. Mm. So you, you lose some of that tax ability, uh, ta tax rebate. And so, of course, you in theory, have to top up more. Uh, but given that the rates have come down at a drastic rate and there has been upward pressure on rents because of the housing shortage, and that's going to get so much worse before it gets better, if it ever gets better, um, that I, I think that um, you, you'd be able to buy something quality with very minimal money down and very minimal money on a contribution for a long while. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned your podcast before. Uh, just, just tell us the uh, name and because last time I looked, it was number one in the business category. Okay. Yeah, still the Property Academy podcast, number one business podcast in New Zealand, which Ed and I are very proud of. Yeah. Ed, you're remarkably quiet today. It's amazing. That's because you won't shut up. <laughs> and, let me talk. Let me talk. It's my so, turn. I uh, want to say something. Anyway, Ed, tell us something interesting. Oh, well, I've got many things to say, Rupert, but the yeah. first is this. Tomorrow, Episode 350 of the Property Academy podcast goes live. In two weeks' time, we are going to hit our anniversary. So for anybody who hasn't heard of it, um, we do record a daily show, uh, about 10 to 15 minutes every day with something new about the property market, a new fundamental concept of property investment, a new analysis of a city. Uh, we're, we're constantly doing stuff. And actually, I tell you what, Saturdays, this Saturday is going to be an excellent one, episode 352. Andrew and I share our monopoly strategies and what property investors can learn from playing Monopoly about the market in, in, in real life, which is very fascinating. And given that uh, all of Auckland's still in lockdown, great time to dust off that Monopoly board and cause a family feud. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And the rules change depending on who you're playing with. It's, it's great. Oh, no, yeah, it's, free parking. Do you do free parking? Yes, I do do free we parking. Put, you get the money yes, if you live completely it distorts the entire game, but I love it. Yeah. Yes, yes. You've got to add the, the, the hit of uh, that capital injection. It's the equivalent of... Uh, Lotto. Of, well, really, I was, I was going to say um, of quantitative easing. <laughs> hey, but let me talk about the market, Rupert, yeah, because I'll tell you something. Just as we were going into lockdown, I wrote an article uh, for Stuff, and it was called Economists Are Often Wrong, because all of the economists were predicting, uh, not all of them, but we were expecting some significant hits, or there are predictions about significant hits to house prices. Somewhere between 15 and 40% was what I was reading. And I wrote an article saying that, actually, uh, economists often get get it wrong. We have very scary predictions, but they don't always eventuate. And I pulled out data from the previous recession, 2008, when we had an economic downturn and showed some of the predictions that had come from the bank economists and showing how actually the market recovered much more quickly. Than, than previously. Now, I actually got copped a bit of flack from this. I His had, fellow economist, Barden. <laughs> well, I had one person email me saying that I shouldn't be allowed to uh, communicate with the public. But look, <laughs> here we are. The market has defied expectations. Uh, and that's for a couple of reasons. So what we've really seen in the market is that supply of actual listings is heavily down. People who don't have to sell their house aren't selling it. And instead, what we're seeing is everybody's or a, a significant number of homeowners are taking the money they would have otherwise spent on international travel, and they're taking the money that they've saved during lockdown because they haven't been out at bars and restaurants or Kmart, and instead they're renovating their homes. 
instead of selling them and trading up. Now that's keeping supply off the market. So there's not a number, uh, uh, we've got a record low number of listings at the moment. So very short supply. At the same time, first home buyers are very active in the market. They've been very saving active. over lockdown. They've been researching, they're seeing the lower interest rates and they're taking action. On top of that, you've got investors who are very active in the market because they've had time to think about it over lockdown. Some of them are expecting to see bargains. They're not finding them because you've got more demand and tight supply, which is keeping those prices buoyant. Mm. One thing that is really confusing people at the moment as well is that the median house price, the national median house price is jumping around all over the place. And the reason for that is during the lockdown and in the months following, the number of houses sold per month was way down. You couldn't buy a house. You couldn't mm. get to an open home. Now, what that meant was that in some months, Auckland houses, which are more expensive, made up a much bigger proportion of what sold. So that will pull the average up. Yep. This low month, population sample, right? Low, low samples. That's right. Lower yep. samples. And the makeup is changing. You see, in this month that we're currently in of August and September, we're probably going to see the median national house price drop significantly. Yes, mm -hmm. Now, Auckland. that's got nothing to do with how property Actual values value. are, yep. but it's just that fewer properties in Auckland happen to sell, uh, mm. sell during that time. So we're going out and actually saying, hey, expect some negative headlines, but that's got nothing to do with the actual property values. It's just what happened to sell in that particular month, which is really important to note. And mm. yeah, it's really interesting because, um, because property is just the topic that sells newspapers. It gets a lot of that and Donald Trump get, get you know a lot of a lot of airtime, and um and, and it's and it's ingrained in our blood. And there's so much um, kind of data that goes out there and gets thrown around, like the median house value, and it gets so distorted. And yeah. so that that's why we do our podcast to kind of actually break it down to what it actually means. And sometimes you know a dropping median house value does mean the market is dropping, but often it might not at all. It might just be exactly what you'd say. There's a lower sample in the market. And actually one of the really uh, the other really interesting articles that we wrote during lockdown, I think I wrote this one, which was the... Um, the, the I know what he's going to say. <laughs> the, three, the three things which would send the property market berserk coming out of this. And, and the three things that we said were lower test rates on servicing. Tick. Lower LVR. Uh, oh, LVR restrictions being eased. Tick. And the third one was a red hearing, which we just said longer loan terms. Now, back when mortgages uh, were, were in the state of New Zealand, what was the year of that? This is back in the 1920s. 1920s. The loan terms were actually only five years. So they were yep. really, really low. And we we're normally now they're 30 years. And actually thinking back, when I was at the BNZ 15, uh, 18 years ago, they were actually uh, 25 years there. It was, it was only later that they got extended to 30 years. Because we're living longer and working longer now, usually out of necessity, mm -hmm. we can actually pay off a loan over a longer period of term, or, term, or we can have a, um, yeah, just have a longer work life. So that's why that's why that's going to happen, and it's highly probable that sometime in the future, maybe not the near future, but in the future, that loan terms might go out to thirty-five or forty years because people tend to pay them off much faster than that. But the term can be documented over someone's work life, and so two of those three things, and they were the two that we kind of were hoping for, have actually already happened, and we're starting to see that momentum in the market already. So the reason that's really important as well, Rupert, just to jump in there, is that. We often hear people say, look, we're not going to see significant amounts of capital gains in the, in the future because uh, some people will attribute historical capital gains to one-off factors. So uh, deregulation in the market, a whole heap of baby boomers coming over, uh, becoming older. And so what that article was really about was saying, well, let's look at the one-off things that could happen. So we gave an example in that article of an investor that when the LVR restrictions were lifted, they could borrow 50% more because you get two hits of the cherry. Not only can you borrow more against the property you're going to buy, you can leverage more of your existing portfolio to fund those new deposits. So that, that has a major shift, particularly for marginal investors who didn't quite have enough deposit uh, previously. That's probably why you're seeing more investors active in the market. The other thing around those services 
reducing test interest rates is people who are on, on lower and limited incomes. Uh, I think that when we ran the numbers based on 5.8%, some borrowers would be able to borrow 13% more. They'd be able to take on more debt. And look, what we know just from experience, and I'd, I think you'd probably find the same, is that if you give a first home buyer and a a pre-approval for an extra 50 grand, they're going to go and spend it. Yep, mm. absolutely. Yeah, they will spend to the maximum capacity that they are allowed to. Uh, now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is, is arguable. Sometimes they're buying a better quality property. Uh, As an investor, I think it's a very, very good thing. You should all spend all your money. First time buyers, please. It's good good for house prices because we will see um, people bidding up the prices because they've got the ability to. And we have had questions, people saying to us, well, just because people have the ability to take on more debt to bid up house prices doesn't mean that they necessarily will, Mm. um, which, which is true. But what I would expect is that if you've got two first home buyers who are in a multi office situation, going for the same price, the prices are going to start to get, um, be bidded up, especially at a time where we have low stock. I'll just give you an example. Uh, down here in Christchurch, uh, uh, I work at the office quite late and we have some lovely cleaners who come in at about 8pm. And I got talking to one and he says to me, uh, oh, look, uh, you're in property, right? I said, yes. He says, there's just no houses. I'm trying to help my friends buy houses and the prices keep going up. Now, they're, they're at the, the lower end of the market down here in Christchurch, but it's indicative that they're just saying there's no stock. Mm, With, yes. You know, prices are going up. It's ridiculous. Yeah, and it's really interesting, um, especially around the kind of millennial age group, they do want a lot in their first house. So our parents' generation, for example, were often more likely to buy an older house and that would satisfy them for 10 years they do some renovations and they use it as a stepping stone. Millennials, um, and I am one, so I can say this, we're spoiled. Um, and, and, and we do want everything that our parents had straight away. We don't want to have to wait. Um, we, we want to have our avocado and eat it too. So, so you do see a lot of these higher value houses now going to people who are first home buyers. Yep. And, and if uh, interest rates go from two and a half to one and a half, as they predicted to, that's massive savings. You can afford to do that and pay a mortgage and pay a mortgage down cheaper yep. than you can afford rent. Yeah. It's absolutely crazy, isn't it, at the moment? I and agree actually, with the loan term in terms of why should a 25-year-old have to pay off a mortgage in 30 years, right? Yeah. That, that Their working life is till 75 by the time they get there, probably by yeah. the time I get there, which isn't that far away anymore. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, I think you could almost set a, an age limit where you want yes. to be paid off by then right now. That's right. 50 years That's is right. probably a lot for a 25-year-old. But, but yeah, I, I absolutely agree that the loan term could be extended and therefore give people so much more purchasability, right? Yeah, Yeah, just one thing that Ed touched on before that um, jumped into my mind um, is whether or not we're going to see capital growth. And and like, as a long-term investor, I forget about what the capital growth is going to be in the short term. I just think about the long term because I know it goes up and it's the bank's money. I don't care. And if it's not costing me much per week to own a property, you're just going to put that to park that to one side. However, there's always these arguments about one-off factors like baby boomers and all this kind of stuff, whether or not property prices are going to continue growing at the rate that they have in the past. And historic growth is no guarantee for future growth. But Ed and I did a great webinar over the lockdown and that's available on our website, opuspartners.co.nz pre previous hyphen webinars and um, we we actually debate whether or not properties will go up in the future at you know double in value in the future and um, that was actually one of the really really good interesting ones that we did um, and and the, the consensus was yes um, yeah. the main conclusion was that you will expect to see you will always expect to see some capital growth it's just well how many years are we talking about our conclusion yes. is generally we don't think it's going to be the 10 that it's been in the past but 15 you know, uh, 16, 14, depending on the region, that's probably going to be more realistic. And even when you talk to some of the uh, cynics around capital growth, uh, usually uh, you'll get them to agree that uh, an underlying rate might be something like inflation plus 1%. So we're talking 3% capital growth a year. There's actually not too much of a difference between 3% and 5%. I mean, it does make a big difference. Mm -hmm. But and for a long-term investor who's thinking about 15 years, it, it, it... it doesn't make that much of a difference whether it's 3 or 5% because the numbers still stack up. I always think that um, we should all invest like Sir Bob Jones who who just buys things and never sells them because by the time 50 years into the future, when I'm 57, uh, not 57, when I'm 77, (laughs) I have absolute confidence that house prices will be four times what they are today. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the key rule is if you ever sell a house, never look at its value again because you'll just be disappointed. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so first home, so people have got their first home and they, they want to come and talk to you about investment property. What would you sort of be telling them at the moment? Where would you be looking? Do they have to buy in the same city as, as they're currently living in? What What's your sort of Do you want key to take this of, one, Ed? Yeah. So what I would say is generally speaking, it's probably better not to buy in your home city. The reason being that uh, you're putting several of your eggs in, in one basket. Generally, I like to spread that risk around. We were just recording a video just before we jumped on here, Rupert, talking about different property cycles. And what we know is that different regions will heat up, their property markets will heat up at different uh, periods. So Auckland, for instance, has been, the, the property prices there have been relatively flat over the last four years, whereas Wellington has been hot for the last five. Now, as Andrew mentioned, we'd expect Wellington to uh, cool down and stagnate for a period after this. So if you're living in Wellington, you might look at how house prices have been uh, astro gone astronomically high over the last five years. And the question is, is that going to continue? Is the region that you're currently living in at an opportune point in its property cycle? The areas that we see are, are really good parts of the property cycle. Christchurch, it's about 15% underneath its uh, long-term historical average. Over the last 27 years, Canterbury uh, median house price has been 88% of the New Zealand median house price. So what that means is that over the long term, if the national median house price was $500,000, you'd expect Canterbury to be 88% of that. That's what it has been historically. Right now, the Canterbury median house price is about 75% of that national median house price. And just to put that in terms that are a bit easier to understand, Dunedin is more expensive now than Christchurch. Now, we don't see that this is a sustainable way or a sustainable level of house prices, and we would expect some catch-up growth, which is exactly what happened to Wellington five years ago, where it had been flat for a long time. It was well below its long-term average house price. Then we saw the catch-up growth. We saw house prices take off. So we're expecting to see that pattern happen in Christchurch. Similarly with Auckland, we're expecting to see that because uh, the rest of the country has caught up to Auckland. And now uh, it's at the point where we're starting to see that market heat up again. Mm. Mm. And do you think the new tenancy rules are going to hugely affects the value or the appetite or what's your read on those rules? Uh, this is my one now. Um, yeah, so, so, so um, we actually did a podcast on this a couple of weeks ago because um, yes, the regulation has tightened up. It is no more, it's not that significant. Like, yes, there are some changes, um, but actually um, some of the, some of the ones that made the most press kind of don't really impact property investors that much. If they're a long-term investor and if they're using a property manager, it's probably not going to be that big a deal. And in actual fact, there's actually some wins. So for example, um, if, if you have a tenant at the moment that keeps falling in arrears and you give them a notice to remedy and they remedy it and it happens time and time again, you can't evict them on that basis. But now, going forward, if you have a recidivist offender, you can actually evict them on that, uh, on that basis. So as a long-term investor, I don't think it's going to have a major impact at all, but it has made the headlines a lot. So anyone who's not maybe getting some advice on getting into the market reading the newspaper, they might be thinking, actually, I, this sounds too hard, I'm not going to bother. So yeah. there will be fewer people entering the market as a result. There will also be people, be people who have maybe had older properties that have had a lot of maintenance issues. They've gone through all the healthy home stuff. This is just kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back. They'll exit the market as well. So this will put more pressure on the rental stock available. So that will probably actually drive rent prices up. So actually for most investors, it, this will be a positive. Yep, yeah, and getting the right, well, and I was just gonna say, getting the right um, sort of uh, help, the professional help, and I know you guys help a lot with uh, rental management and getting accountants involved and things. And I think a lot of people get sick of rental properties because they haven't got that professional backing. They're not willing to pay Absolutely. a couple of grand a year. Yeah. To protect well, themselves from tens yeah. of grands, tens of grand, you know, tens of thousands of dollars 
a year of losses, really. You only need to go on to the Property Investor Forums online, which Ed and I um, uh, lurk around, and you see constant questions from people who are DIY investors. Mm. Uh, and so, so they, they, are, they are landlords, not investors. We call them landlords. They're actually doing it themselves. And it's a real pain in the butt for these yeah. people. These, yeah. these guys are trying to figure out how to replace a washer, whatever that is. They're trying to, they're trying to do everything themselves, and um, they're trying to figure out how to evict someone. They've got problematic tenants. They don't know about the inspections that could void their insurance. It's a real issue. If you're going to invest in property, do it right because that's how you become a successful investor and actually make money out of it. If you want to, if you want to be a DIY investor, just don't bother at all. Yeah, yeah. our approach there, Rupert, generally is that if you're so focused on the property and managing a property, you can't manage the portfolio. If you really want to become a successful investor, you've got to grow a portfolio of assets and and focus your mind on growing that portfolio rather than managing this individual property. Because if you're so into the one specific property, then uh, it, getting an extra one's too hard. Yeah. You really want to build a portfolio of several investment properties. And the best way we know to do that is to do it, is to treat it passively, to, to build it up and not be involved in the day-to-day -day running, but just focus on how can I grow a portfolio? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, so tell us a bit about the tools that you've got on your website because you have probably some of the best tools I've ever seen, including your data, which I love. So just tell us, you've got, you've got obviously your data, you've got your podcast. What else have you got? This one's all you. Um, look, look our, our approach, uh, to, to be honest with you, Rupert, has been to just put as much free stuff and, and be as honest as we can with just educating uh, regular people about property investment. So you know, look, on our website, you'll find some very uh, long form articles. We've got a 16,000 word article on how to invest in property that outlines absolutely everything. There's a 10,000 word guide on how to uh, get a mortgage. There's an 8,000 word guide on, uh, on preparing for retirement. And I'm about to put up a full thousand word guide about how to use property to build a passive income um you know so there's a lot of really good long form meaty stuff we're actually just recording today uh we're, we're doing a redo of our property investment course it's called the property academy video course uh there's currently 15 videos or 14 videos on our website of andrew educating people about property investment so if you don't like to read then maybe you like to watch we're redoing that now it's going to be about 28 or 30 lessons long with uh we're even going to go into a couple of properties and do a walkthrough to to really show people the difference between new and existing properties. Uh, we do our podcast every every uh, day, 10 minutes. And also we, we release more data than anybody else on this website. So you can go through and look at, hey, Canterbury's median house prices, 75% of New Zealand's median. But you can check that out for the West Coast or Taranaki and Nelson and a whole heap of regions that we don't get involved in uh, because we think it's important to give that data. You can go onto our website and see every suburb in the country, what was the median house price in that suburb for the last 20 20 years. We spend four figures on data and just release it publicly because we believe it's the right thing to do because people want to know. Yep, absolutely. And the Brilliant. webinars, don't forget the webinars. Oh, yeah, Every course. month now, we produce a brand new presentation and it'll be 50 minutes or, or an hour of new content. So new meaty content. We don't just repeat the same seminar over and over again. So we've got that debate about um, capital gains. Are, are house prices really going to double? We've got a presentation on how COVID would affect the market. We've got a presentation on Airbnbs. We went through uh, and looked at, well, which areas in New Zealand, which council areas are most at risk of an onslaught of Airbnbs? That's there. There's, uh, Andrew walked through how to grow your portfolio from two to five properties. This um, coming Tuesday, we've got four real investors who are going to share their numbers, regular people yeah. talking about their investments. That's going to be quite powerful. This is going to be one of the most exciting ones that we've done. So we've actually taken clients that have been working with me for a number of years and also uh, one who's independent who's just joined our team. And we're actually looking at their real life scenario of what they've done. And it's, it's pretty awesome stuff. Brilliant. All right. We'll make sure we get this interview up and uh, up quickly online. And, uh, and so everyone can enjoy that because I, I've sat in on some of your webinars and they are very cool. I think you guys have the best information in the industry. So it's um, very cool to get them part of that. All right, guys, anything else? Any last tips for, the, uh, for anyone looking? What's the, 
I think um, I spoke to a guy today. Uh, it's a new client uh, working with me. I had an interview with him this morning and he just, his first thing is like, he said, I just want to thank you for just making this so easy in terms of information. We haven't done anything with him yet. He's like, he decided over lockdown that he wanted to get educated on property investment. He's really motivated young guy, uh, 29, doesn't own his own house, but has a deposit for an investment property. He's decided that's the path he wants to go. And he read the Epic Guide to uh, Property Investment, uh, which is the long form uh, article that he was talking about before. And he, said he just loved it. Then he started watching the webinars, the podcast. Where, was, where the hell was I going with this? Uh, um, and, and so, yeah, if, if you are in lockdown at the moment, or if you do just want to kind of um, get started, just start to start to get a bunch of information, get educated on property investment, but then better still, do something with that because you can, uh, he was actually going to go, that, that was my train of thought. He was actually going to go into partnership with a friend of his. His friend has done all the research and just wants to keep researching. You don't right. get rich by research. Mm -hmm. And so the key thing is actually take action and do something with the information you learn, um, whether it be with us or anyone else, you're free to use, you're welcome to use all of our information and go and do it yourself. Uh, and then come back to me if you decide that it's too hard. Um, but but <laughs> property is an awesome way to build wealth for the future. It's yeah. Not a, it's not a quick way to make a buck. It is a long way to make a buck, but a lot of bucks. Yeah. And the other thing that I just mentioned, Richard, that we're really excited about is over... Richard. Who's Richard? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, do you know he what does, it was? He goes no, 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 two people at once. It's because he said that you can't uh, get rich by research. And Rich got <laughs> so in my head. So I'll say that. Sorry, Rupert. The other thing that we've done is um, oh, during lockdown, we invested in and purchased Juno Investing Magazine, oh, yeah. which is yeah. New Zealand's only uh, investment magazine, broad investment. And we have just, we got in our hot little hands on Monday, uh, the, the, the latest issue. So this is our first issue, which is the property issue. And it has a gorgeous pink cover, which you'll be able to see in all of the supermarkets. And we're getting a lot of great feedback about this this issue of the magazine because we go back to basics we educate people about it we've also got some really interesting data so uh, our friends at core logic actually gave me uh, again another four figures worth of data which they very kindly gave to me for free so that we could look at well does the number of bedrooms a property has impact its capital growth in terms of how much uh, uh, the, the number of bedrooms has either helped or hindered the property going up in value. So we actually went away, got that data, and it's in Juno Investing Magazine. Excellent magazine. Uh, you can either subscribe to it for $20 for four issues. Andrew keeps telling me it's too, uh, too cheap. cheap. <laughs> <laughs> or it's $10 at the supermarket. So I'd very much recommend reading that. It's a great yeah. magazine. Brilliant. All right. We'll keep that out and keep an eye out for that. Hey, thanks for uh, dialing in, guys. That was really great. We'll get you back in a few months and, and get a further update because uh, always good to chat. Um, oh, nice partners. to see you, Richard. Yeah, this has been, it's been great hosting Richard. Uh, yeah, Opus Partners, O-P-E-S Partners .nz, uh, for all of those cool tools. The uh, Remind me of the podcast, Property Academy. Property Academy podcast. Don't have to scroll too far on the list on Apple to find it. It's right up the top there. And, uh, and, and make sure to check that out. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.